it's not just a television show anymore. It has to be television, digital, online, social media. A Life in News. News Hour anchor Jeffrey Brown, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Hello, I'm Richard Ager. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. As a PBS viewer, you've probably seen Jeffrey Brown on the PBS NewsHour. He's one of the anchor team that delivers news and interviews every night. In his 20 years on the NewsHour team, he has worked to bring new subjects to broadcast news. In a moment, our interview with Jeffrey Brown. The congressional report was a bipartisan effort, and we hear first on this issue from the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Maryland Congressman Dutch Rupersberger. Jeffrey Brown is accustomed to sitting down with the nation's leaders, whether it's congressmen concerned about trade with China or a Supreme Court justice criticizing the court decision that put George W. Bush in the White House. I thought the majority was wrong. But Brown gets out of Washington to report on developing stories around the world. In this case, a cholera outbreak in Haiti. Today we came into the valley, which is where cholera, the outbreak, actually began. Uh, along this river here seems to be how it spread. And uh, we're at an ox, we're in a very small community here where Oxfam has come in uh, for an education uh, pro program. Because again, the whole idea is you got to tell people how to avoid getting cholera. In the midst of reporting and producing, Brown has also succeeded in creating Artbeat, now a regular feature on the news hour, in an effort to reinvigorate arts reporting. Thank you. You say right at the beginning of this book that Joseph Pulitzer was, quote, the midwife to the birth of the modern mass media. What does that mean? Well, way? I struggled with that word because I think of uh, the comparison that Picasso wasn't the only cubist, yet he was the central one. Pulitzer was the central man who reshaped the American media. Others were involved in that, Hearst, his great imitator. But Pulitzer changed journalism entirely in a way that all of our news consumption habits today, the very idea of purchasing news, the way it's written, the style it's written, the basis of a story being part of news are all gifts that Pulitzer gave to us and changed America. So Jeffrey Brown, you're here in Wyoming, which is a thrill, out, out of the a, studio in Washington. It's a thrill for me to get away. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> we're glad to have you, but one of the things we're here to talk about is, is the kind of big wide world of media and the way it's been changing and changing really rapidly. And we're, we're up in Jackson, we've got people here who in the newspaper business, which is another media forum that is struggling and going through all kinds of changes, television as well. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about where you see it going and what effect it's had on PBS and, and the News Hour. Well, start with some history. I mean, I think we all in our lifetimes remember growing up that in television terms, there were, what, three networks. And if you think about important moments in your life or in the life of this country, and I'm old enough to remember things like the, the death of John F. Kennedy, who told us, how did we learn about that? You learned about it from Walter Cronkite and at the time, three, three networks. It was a completely different world. And those were mass audiences. Those were millions and many, many millions of people. Then you think about where we are now and what has happened since then. First, you added several networks. Then you added the world of cable television. Then you added the world of the internet. And now you're adding the world of mobile and social media. So it is a completely different uh, media environment uh, that affects all kinds of programming. It certainly affects the news. It, it, the newspaper business, we can talk about that if, if you like, but obviously it's having a profound effect on the newspaper business across the country. And we've covered this on the news hour, and I talk to people in this business all the time, where uh, many towns are, you know, it's, it's rare to have more than one newspaper in a city anymore. Most of us are used to remember days when there were more than, certainly there were more than one. That's totally changed. Uh, some cities now are on the verge, are close, to not having any newspapers. I don't know if you all recently saw one of the most famous uh, papers around, the Times-Picayune in New Orleans, just announced that it was only going to publish, I think it's three days a week, and the rest of the time it's going to be the online uh, New Orleans, uh, nola.com it is. 
So that's just the beginning of a wave of things in the newspaper business. In the television business, it means that we all have to deal with a very new world. People just don't watch television the way they used to, especially young people don't watch television the way they used to. Right, and in fact, we can look at the statistics. There's a decline in people who, like some of us still do, would go at six o'clock to see the news and expect to see an hour or a half hour of news, right. and they're, then they're done. It's just part of the daily habit. I mean, it's, also, it's interesting because we still show up every morning and we sit down, as we always have, and we think about what is that one hour program that we do. We, we do it from six to seven as a live program. So it is a live program. And many places around the country take it as a live program. Some, some show it a little bit later. But, but we sit down in an editorial meeting and we say, what, is the, what are the main stories of the day? What is the first story, the lead story? What's the next story? We plot out a one hour program. And that in a, in a way is so old fashioned. I mean, we know we're doing it. We, you know, but we can, and that's our mindset because, and thank God, there are many people who still watch it. I hope many of you as a, you know, as a point, what do they call appointment television, you know, at whatever time it is around the country, you'll turn on and you'll see the news hour or whatever program you're used to seeing and you'll watch it. Many people now watch it online or they watch it all kinds of ways. And if they watch it online, they're not watching all the time beginning, middle and end. So all that editorial decision making that we made, it could be for not for them. They just might want to go quickly to segment two, or they might say, oh, I hate that Jeffrey Brown, so I will never watch one of his segments, or whatever, whatever it is. Or they love the arts thing at the end. And that's a, that's a totally different world that we're just getting our minds into. And as you do, you're doing what a lot of other media outlets are doing. You're putting more and more information on the, on the web, on the internet, and in fact, Someone who doesn't get enough of the news hour, which has always prided itself, I think, on giving people more than you get from a commercial news broadcast. But if you don't get enough, you can go to the internet now and find expanded interviews, more information, all kinds of special topics and things. That's right. We, we, everything, almost everything we do, um, we think about what's the television component and what's the online component. Um, not everything, because sometimes things are happening too fast and it's too last minute, and we, and we can't have that extra component. But certainly, any time I go out into the world and do a story, and any time we have uh, enough planning time, we plan, we, and, we're, and we're, we're, we're not as good at this as we should be, but we're getting better. We, we sit down and we think about what part of it is on television, what part of it is online. Because in our, we're telling ourselves, and, and we, and when I say we, I mean the news hour, but I mean the entire news business, that you have to think of yourself now as a continuous sort of loop. It's, it's not just a television show anymore. It has to be television, digital, online, social media. For many of us, and I include myself, that's still hard to kind of get your mind around. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you change your day? You know, how do you change your thinking? If you, if you just think you're aiming for a six o'clock show, then you might structure your day in a certain way, the way we're familiar with, you know? Right. We'll have a story meeting, an editorial meeting, and then people go off and do things, and there's a certain time for this and a certain time for that. But if, you're, if you know you have to be, uh, because the online world is just never stopping and always on, then you have to think a little differently. You have to think, what am I gonna do earlier in the day? What am I gonna do after the show ends? You still have to have that gin and tonic at a certain time just before Well, with me it's scotch, but, okay. there's a, but, there, there, but there has to be a moment for that. Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the news hour and its evolution, because you are going through these changes right yeah. now. Yeah. But in fact, uh, it, it's really in some ways a fairly young program, if we consider television generally to be young. You began in the well, 1970s. Well, it's funny to say right? that, because yeah. in television terms, it's ancient. Right. You know? uh, so for something to be around for more than 30 years yeah. is, uh, is a long time in, in uh, in television terms. And when you started in the 70s, it was meant to be the first program to take a, a subject and go in depth. And yeah, the original uh, uh, Robin, Mc well, uh, Robin and, and Jim started this out of coming together out of doing the Watergate hearings. That was the original uh, public television idea was we'll try to have a, uh, bring something together and they brought the two of these guys together who were quite different and didn't know each other at the time and they turned out to be a 
spectacular team together to, do, to cover the uh, gavel to gavel Watergate coverage. And that was a success. And so it, uh, it started as a half hour, one subject program. It was uh, Robin was the lead, uh, the, the, Mc, the Robert McNeil report for a half hour, one subject. Now we, we go back and look at these sometimes now for fun. <laughs> they could be pretty funny uh, to watch them. But that was the idea, and then it expanded to uh, an hour. And that was sort of revolutionary, because at the time there was no such thing in television. Everything was uh, uh, in commercial, new, uh, the network news is a half hour, and of course when you take out all the commercials it's 20 some minutes. And so to have an hour uh, on, on different subjects, and that's sort of the first time, and this is just before I started there, but that's the first time when they, we started thinking this could be a place where people could come and get your news. So it's not just an adjunct to what you're watching on the networks. You want to talk a little bit about your history with what used to be the McNeil Air News Hour, now the PBS News Hour? Sure, I started in 1988 uh, and it was the McNeil Air News Hour and I was in New York. Uh, with Robert McNeil. So McNeil was in New York and Jim Lair was in Washington. And uh, I was hired, uh, I had actually, I don't know if you, many of you probably know this name, but before that I had worked for a man named Fred Friendly, who was a very famous name in television history and the history of public broadcasting. But he had been Edward R. Morrow's uh, producer and he um, uh, is responsible for many of the early and very famous documentaries, the See It Now, back to the 50s, and then things like Harvest of Shame, CBS Reports, and he became the, the president of CBS News. When I met Fred, uh, he was uh, retired from all of that. Oh, and then he, then he was one of the major visionaries and founders of public broadcasting uh, after he left commercial television. When I met Fred, he was, start he was doing a uh, small production company, which was mostly doing shows for PBS, and that was my inroad actually into television because I had not actually expected to go into television. I was thinking of uh, um, uh, print journalism. Uh, but I met Fred at Columbia uh, University, Columbia Journalism School, where he was teaching. And uh, he hired me to help produce these programs that we did for uh, public television. So I was with Fred for an, uh, uh, a few years, and then I got a call to come to the news hour. I was hired as a... Uh, they said the job is an off-camera um, economics reporter. I have to say I knew nothing about economics, <laughs> but that's the nature of this business. And, and at a place like the News Hour, you can learn very quickly because you have the ability to talk to very high-level people. So I, was, I, I uh, started there as an off-camera sort of reporter, producer. I became a producer of segments. I rose up to become a, a senior producer. And this was, uh, and I spent, so I was one of the sort of senior top producers of The Daily Show. I was responsible for a number of different areas on the show. One of those that I took on out of great interest and because I thought it wasn't getting enough attention was the arts and, arts and culture. And at a certain point, um, maybe because as I said, I wanted to be in print originally and because one of my jobs was editing other people's writing all the time, I, I, I always thought I could do, I could write better. So I, uh, I decided I'd like to try and I'm at a, it's a small enough place where I could just ask the bosses, uh, said hey how about if I try doing a piece and they were nice enough to sort of let me do one or two arts pieces while I did all this other stuff on the, as my main job. So it grew from there and then they made me the art correspondent while I was a senior producer on all these other things and then Jim said one day why don't you um, come into the studio and, and try interviews that way. And then uh, he said, uh, he was always a step ahead of me, which was nice. I didn't have to say, damn it, you know, why aren't I this or that? And, um, and it, it, in, a, in a nice sort of, um, I think, organic way, it grew to, um, to being an anchor there. And I, frankly, sometimes think of myself as an accidental anchor. I never thought of it, never planned it, never really imagined it but that's what's happened. So I, I still love doing the arts and culture, but that's now a side in a different way. Right. Most of the time I'm in the studio doing whatever the news is. And don't give up the arts because it actually is one of the many things that you can only find at that depth 
where you're going to do a 10-minute interview or do something with that kind of, of you know, reach. It is hugely important, yeah. and since you've given me the opening, I'll just say it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. And it is hugely important to public broadcasting. Because right. if you want to know what, el what, you know what we do that others don't do, that's one of them. And, and, and the, when, I, when I do go around the country and speak to audiences, I try to talk about, uh, one of the things I talk about is this thing that's lack, the things that are lacking in our public discourse. We have a very divisive public discourse in politics and in international affairs. And, and it's incredibly important for us to have that. But there's a lot of other things that don't get covered in the news and in public discourse. One of them is the arts and culture. So I always say I'm interviewing our nation's writers and our artists and our musicians. And the way, you'd come to the, the way you might come to the news hour and expect us to interview newsmakers, you know who those are. Those are the presidents and the senators and the generals and the CEOs and the heads of other countries. But I want us to be interviewing cultural newsmakers as well so that our, our, our best writers and artists and musicians can tell us something about the way we live as well. You've actually just begun, I think, a definition of what it is to be public media because you're talking about covering an area, the arts, that may not be getting the kind of in-depth coverage that you're giving it in commercial media and in other resources. And I think this gives us a chance to maybe talk a little bit for everybody here about what public media really is in an era when the distinctness of it back when it began as a kind of educational conduit has become a little blurred. There are so many different forms of media, so many, such a proliferation of cable television outlets with all kinds of specialties. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to give us as, as best you can an idea of what it means to be public media. Well, you know, it, 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 in a way it goes back to where we started, the changes in, um, in what's happened to the media. Um, one of the things that's happened in the world of media, especially in television news, is a kind of stratification. Uh, I think of it as a niche world. Uh, as I said, uh, you think long ago, and there was these mass audiences of, of, um, of, nightly, of the nightly news. And now there are, there's, a, there's a, a station, a channel here, and a channel here, and a cha there's thousands of them. And they all are known for, they might be known for their one little niche. And politically, we see what's happened. So that whichever of your political persuasion, you can just go to your political niche. You can go to your cable channel. Now I think, I'm not against that. I think that's a fine thing. People can go to Fox if they want, or MSNBC, or CNN, or the, you know, or ESPN if that's where you want to get your, you know, whatever it is. You have the hunting channel, it's a, you're cooking, you know, you can do all of that. But what worries me a bit is that there isn't a place where we talk to each other. I worry that People, if you only go to the cable channel of your liking, in other words, where you're starting, then you are not hearing other views. You are not forced to defend your views. You're in a kind of echo chamber that just echoes your own views. I think the role of public broadcasting, even more than before, is to provide a place, I'm talking about the news aspect to it as well, of course, uh, but it applies in other areas as well, is to, to provide a place where people can come and hear, as, hear other views and be challenged on those views and listen to one another and have a civil debate. So, you know, in one sense you could say, who needs us anymore? You can go anywhere, you can get anything you want. That's true. But the who needs us anymore, I think, has to be that you don't get what we offer any other place precisely because everything has become so divided and stratified. And it's probably worth noting that one of the things that is valued and still remains distinct about public, the news hour actually, is that it is one of the most trusted outlets for news and information. It is in fact the most, by the polling I've seen, trusted news outlet on television for news and information. But there's one other aspect uh, that, that defines in people's minds public media, and that is government support. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some would say that's singling out one particular venue to get that kind of uh, taxpayer assistance, if mm -hmm. you will. How do you respond to that? 
Well, government support is, is less than it used to be, certainly. It's a less uh, a, a proportion of our, um, of our overall um, funding. Um, the funding model overall has completely changed, but the government aspect to it, I guess I would say sort of what I was just saying. Yeah. That, um, that the, you know, the, I always say that in the, of the, when you say PBS, it's the P, it's the P word that is most important to me. I mean, I happen to have gone to public schools. I went to a great public university in California, and I worked for public television almost my whole life. So, and I, and Frank, you know, one other thing I'll throw in for this audience, I love coming to the national parks, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, God bless what we've done here to preserve, you know, for, for the national parks. So I believe in the public, and, the pu and public broadcasting has to be a place for all of that. And so that's why I think there's a role for some government support. We are learning to wean ourselves off that to some degree because I, we're in a, a world of limited budgets. We all know that. And, you know, I, I go out, when I go into the world to cover the economy, and I, boy, I, you know, I, I'm at the uh, food kitchen, and they say, we need your money, you know, we need government support. And, you know, we were talking about education earlier, and God knows that needs support. So there's all kinds of pulls for government support. And, and, and we, shouldn't, we shouldn't, it shouldn't be grabbing, you know. We, we want to make a case for what, what we can get, and then we have to look for, uh, to make the economic model work in every way we can, through corporations, through foundations, through through as, many, as much kind of sponsorship as we can get. And it's worth noting, as you did, that, that in fact, government support for public television generally and for the news hour is actually a fairly small portion. Mm -hmm. You guys have a lot of foundations behind you, a lot of support, a lot of individual contributors that have helped support it. We might want to distinguish that the news hour is distinct from PBS. Yeah. That in fact, you are, you are produced and then delivered to PBS. Right. But again, you've had to struggle at the news hour with funding issues as well. We have to struggle, yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, yes. <laughs> I'm not sure people quite understand to what degree. Yeah. Because I always, when I travel and people say, oh, you're okay, you know, everybody else is in trouble or something. We've, been, we've done quite well because we have a, a great uh, tradition and following and a history. Um, but it's, it's a great struggle and more than ever. The, um, the, uh, you know, when I started there in the early days, um, the, a lot of the funding was from one major corporation. For many years, it would be multiple giving. Uh, well, those days are so far gone. Um, now, it, uh, co uh, corporations give much, much, much less money, and they give it for much, much, much less time. So rather than getting, you know, some millions of dollars guaranteed for five years or ten years, which is what happened at the founding of the news hour, it might be for a quarter, might be for three months, and it might be several hundred thousand dollars. And it's because corporations are just thinking differently about how they get their names out in the world. That's, that's you know, not a knock on them, that's just the changing environment for them. So we have to put together more corporate funding. We've had to turn to much, uh, much more to um, foundation, uh, uh, and they've been wonderful. They often come, it's, that's a, another issue. They often, foundations have um, uh, interest that they um, want to um, put forward. So we, we learn that it, we, we get some funding for science stories, and we get some funding from health stories, and we get some funding, I get some funding from art stories from, from different foundations, including the NEA. So it's uh, much more of a um, struggle than it's ever been. So we, uh, we, need, your, we need your support. <laughs> and, and with the rapidity of these changes and, and the way that you've had to adjust and the news hour has continued to thrive, I guess we have to ask you about the future, whether we're going to all be switching around and finding you on the internet in the future or still turning the dial on the television to find well, you on <laughs> Wyoming PBS, I should yeah. add. <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. I, I think for a good while you're going you're gonna to keep watching. I hope you're going to keep watching us on television. Absolutely. Now, I think, I think this is an evolving model and nobody quite knows the answer. Um, but yes, there's going to be television for, a I think, a long time to come, and there's going to be an internet for a long time to come, and there's going to be these little things that we carry in our pockets. So that, and, and more and more, that's where people are going to be watching. So, um, 
uh, will there be, can there be a, a news hour in PBS in that world? Absolutely. But it requires a, a, a lot of adjustment, which we're still very much in the process of doing. So, uh, so there's technological issues for us. There's, you know, there's um, personnel-wise, if you've been watching us for the last few years, you've seen our latest turn. Uh, Jim Lehrer did an amazing thing um, that I don't know that is, there's any precedent for it. He took his name off a program, you know. If you think about a person at that level, to take your name, it was the news hour with Jim Lair for many years. And he took his name off, and in order to show the audience, the world, that there's a future, and we're now the PBS news hour. And he's built a team of people, and I'm very happy to be one of them, to give, that, uh, give the program that kind of future. Um, we're still in the very early parts of it, kind of feeling our way, seeing what works and what doesn't. So we're feeling our way at the news hour. We're feeling our way at PBS. We're feeling our way at all the stations. I know you have all these issues. And, uh, you know, there should be a future. Good. Well, and we can say, you know, what public television has produced in the past, anything from Mr. Rogers to Julia Child to uh, the news hour, the innovation that we've seen, we're expecting more and looking forward to it. And also, it's great to see somebody from the news hour in the flesh. He's real. <laughs> <laughs> nice Thank to see you. Thank you.